All right, well, let's get started here. We are recording. Thank you everyone for being here for our third webinar in our fall webinar series. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and afterwards the recording uh, will be uploaded uh, to our YouTube channel and a link will also be made available to those who've requested one. Uh, in case you're new to Wild Ones, we are a nonprofit promoting environmentally sound landscaping practices that preserve, preserve biodiversity through the preservation, restoration, and establishment of native plant communities. If you'd like to learn more about our organization, you can go to our website at wildones.org. And if you're interested in joining our chapter, uh, you can go to wildones.org slash membership. Uh, our membership dues uh, go for as low as $25 a year. Uh, that's for students and those on limited income. We don't want financial limitations to prevent anybody from being able to join this organization. Uh, so we are happy to provide that low cost option. Uh, the next tier up, it would be a $40 annual membership for a household, which covers two adults and all children under 18 in your home. If you would like more information, another way to contact us is at wildonesozarkchapter at gmail.com or you can check out our web website, which is facebook.com slash Ozark Wild Ones. All right, our next webinar uh, in the series will be on November 5th. Uh, it's a Thursday at 11 a.m. Cody George will be talking about ecological land care, uh, integrating horticulture with ecology. Uh, Cody George is a former um, horticulture supervisor, I believe at um, Crystal Bridges and now works with Dayton School. But today we have Don, Dr. Don Steinkraus, who is a research professor at the University of Arkansas, where he works on biological control and integrated pest management of insects with microbial pathogens. Uh, Don received his PhD in veterinary entomology and biological control and has been a professor of entomology at the University of Arkansas from 1989 to the present day. Today, Dr. Steinkraus will teach us about the many of the more critical invasive species in the Ozarks and the effects these species have on our native plant species and on the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, Don will discuss what we can do to help manage and control these species. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Don. Okay, thank you very much for your invitation, Eric, and um, happy to see so many people I know, like Cody George there. So anyway, I hope you can all hear me. Um, so I'm gonna jump right in. I don't mind if someone wants to type in a chat message. Um, I, I may not be able to get to it till the end, but uh, I wanna jump right in and start um, now. Let's see here. Okay, so uh, Eric gave me some of my background. I, I'm, I'm a professor of entomology. I taught beekeeping, was on the urban forestry board in Fayetteville. I've been fighting invasive plants um, for at least 10 years, and it is a battle. Um, and I'm mostly going to talk about what I'm actually doing and what I'm seeing and not too much theoretical. Uh, this is a brochure I made when I was on the forestry board. It's one of the first ones. And um, it's still pretty current, actually. And originally, I put on there, you know, kill on site, and people thought that was too harsh. But uh, actually, I do believe most of these plants, if possible, you should kill on site. And uh, I'll talk about that a bit. So I have walked the walk. This is a long time ago at uh, one of the parks in Fayetteville. And a group of us got together to cut up uh, bush honeysuckle and privet. And behind us is a big pile of bush honeysuckle. I have done this year after year with all kinds of plants. Uh, and, and it's almost impossible to imagine how much is out there until you start trying to work on it. And, um, and I'll try to show you some of it, but it's, it's well worth doing and um, we need a lot of people to do it. So I have a take home messages in this talk. And one is the workers are few. So I guess Eric said there's about 40 people signed up today to listen to this, 40 out of a population of 2 million out uh, of a population of 350 million in the country, um, we need thousands and thousands of people to work on these problems. And we cannot count on our local, state, federal workers to solve this problem. They aren't doing it. They don't have the time or the resources. So we need thousands of trained, motivated volunteers 
to work against invasive plants and replace them with native plants. First on your own properties, second in city, state, and national parks, and third on roadsides. So I have a dream. I, I imagine what if 80,000 Arkansans, instead of watching a Razorback football game, all went out and spent the afternoon removing invasive plants. That would be an amazing thing. And we may be able to organize, you know, teams of adults, children, and work on these things because uh, I work primarily by myself and, and I can't do all that much given my available time and energy. Um, I'm going to have some quotes in here that I like a lot. This is one of my favorite quotes called The Extinction of Experience. And um, it was referring to butterflies, but it refers to anything. So the quote is, suppose a creature dies out within your radius of reach, the area to which you have easy access. In some respects, it might as well be gone altogether because you will not be able to see it. So this is true for kids growing up in Fayetteville and Bentonville. Uh, they're not seeing trilliums and uh, jack in the pulpits in our forests because of invasive plants. So for children nowadays, a lot of these things are effectively extinct. Now, I'm sure many of you know this man. He's a friend of mine. I've worked with him. He's an entomologist, uh, Dr. Talamy, and he is uh, one of the best and most knowledgeable people about invasive plants and their effect on our birds and insects and ourselves. And he wrote this book and some other books called Bring Nature Home. So if you haven't read this, which I assume you all have seen it or heard of it, um, or have listened to one of his talks, I highly uh, advise you to get this book. So what does Dr. Talamy say why native plants are important? Well, it's because they're the base of the food chain for our birds and wildlife. And they're the base of the food chain for insects. And exotic plants, the invasive plants, do not support insect diversity. So we've covered the continent with a lot of different exotic plants, which reduces the insects, and then it reduces the birds. Um, and one of Dr. Ptolemy's best ideas is that if all people that had a yard made their yard into a wildlife, wild plant preserve, it'd be bigger than all of our parks put together. It's a cool idea. So some definitions. A native plant in my book is a species of plant that was in North America before Europeans arrived. And they belong in North America. They're part of the food web of insects and birds and other creatures. Exotic plants were brought to North America from other continents. Uh, many are beneficial. Soybean is an exotic plant. Apple trees and peach trees and peonies are all exotic. And then there's invasive plants, and most of these are exotic plants. Although I consider some native plants are invasive. I think red cedar is invasive. And invasive plants have adaptations that make them very successful in colonizing. And most of our invasive plants come from Asia. And an important concept is we're all learners. We all make mistakes. We don't always understand what we know. and um, we, we plant something we shouldn't plant, or we don't destroy something we should have destroyed. And uh, so I'm learning all the time, and um, I'm sure all of you are. So why are invasive plants so successful? First, many of them had adaptations that make them tolerant of drought and cold. Second, they lack native insect herbivores. They often lack native plant pathogens. And an important thing is they almost all are extremely prolific producers of seeds. And they have adaptations that make the seed spread efficient. And primarily humans are spreading these things. We brought them over to this continent, either advertently or inadvertently, and we are responsible. And then many of them have defenses like thorns, persistent roots, or poisons. So here's some adaptations I've observed. Some of them remain green most of the year. This gives them an advantage over native plants, which lose their leaves. So privet and bush honeysuckle are green much of the year. 
They leaf out earlier than native plant. That also gives them an advantage. Privet and honeysuckle are an interesting example. Then they often shade out everything around them so that seedlings and other plants cannot grow, resulting in a monoculture. Some of them produce allelopathic chemicals, which are poisons that they use to poison other plants nearby. Ailanthus trees, privet, bush honeysuckle, all produce poisons, which kill other plants that are trying to germinate. And then some of them strangle native plants like Japanese honeysuckle, kudzu, uh, winter creeper, and others. Okay, so they have certain advantages. They really do extremely well. They are a major national problem, even international, not just state or regional. And why are they a problem? They reduce plant, insect, and bird abundance and diversity. They kill valuable trees. They are generally not as attractive as native plants. They do not support native herbivores. Most like Ailanthus are useless as timber or as food. Uh, they don't support our pollinators very well. And controlling them is expensive in time, energy, money, and often results in use of herbicides. And one of the most important messages about invasive plants is they are greedy. They take everything and give little back. So here's a case history from my land in West Fork. Um, on this slide, you see great blue lobelia, a very pretty native wildflower. I just love this plant. And we had a natural stand of it on our land uh, a number of years ago. So these pictures were taken in 2016. And here's a, a skipper on a blue lobelia flower. And we have fescue on our property, tall fescue that has completely crowded out these lobelia plants that are no longer there. And um, so this shows a picture. This is the area along our little wet weather creek and all of this grass, which is dry in this picture, is uh, tall fescue. And it grows so densely that we had a, a, a patch of blue lobelia down near the beginning of the ditch for years and the, the fescue crowded it out. Now I've burned the fescue, I've pulled it up, I've dug it up, but I'm not sure how to restore the lobelia in the site. This is an example of how one plant takes over and prevents anything else to grow. That's what I call a greedy invasive plant. And tall fescue is not native. So I see this everywhere. Invasive plants are displacing more valuable native plants. Uh, if you go along the roadsides, like on Greg Street down near the pack rat, there used to be lots of goldenrods and asters in there. Now it's all Johnson grass, Sericea lespedesia, and other things we don't want. And so these invasive plants take over and they aren't providing any uh, caterpillars for the birds or moths for the birds. And I'm convinced that invasive plants are an important reason behind bird declines, among other things. So just to backtrack, why are native plants important? Because they produce the caterpillars our songbirds need. And um, without lots of caterpillars, birds cannot feed their young. And, and they really need that. Now in Fayetteville, it's wall-to-wall -wall bush honeysuckle in large areas and privet. Those are not producing caterpillars. The songbirds are having to work way too hard to find caterpillars. So providing food for songbirds is an important reason for native plants. And things like our uh, Flying insectivorous birds like night hawks, their diet is 90% moths. Those moths come from caterpillars. Those caterpillars come from native plants. So if you have acres and acres of invasive plants, you're not producing moths, which the birds can eat. So there's lots of our beautiful birds are totally dependent upon insects. Then, you know, for pollinators and butterflies, our native plants are essential. Almost none of the invasive plants are producing uh, food for our, our, our native species of butterflies and moths and other insects and pollinators. So this is swamp milkweed, which I planted on my land a number of years ago, 20, 2015, and produced hundreds of monarch larvae, and you can see some hummingbird moths and swallowtails, a, a, a beautiful plant. But the fescue and Johnson grass have recently crowded that out, and we've lost our, our pockets of swamp milkweed. Um, other reasons for animal and plant declines, of course, are our developments. 
I mean, anybody that looks at a modern development and Fayetteville is covered with developments. It's almost all exotic plants and there's not much there for any wildlife and certainly not for our wild native plants. And this is up at the mall in Fayetteville. Uh, we've covered a lot of the earth with um, concrete and asphalt and roads, parking lots. And then we also have the soybeans and corn, which are immense monocultures, which also are generally not producing caterpillars or moths and are not providing habitat for native plants. Um, we're putting a lot of strikes against wildlife. Uh, this is just long corn in Iowa when I was traveling. Basically, we've, we put in GMO corn, it's no longer producing moths. Uh, we're making life tough for birds and um, wildlife. If you add up all the factors impacting birds, insects, and native plants, it's amazing we still have anything. You know, I didn't add up all of the area in the U.S. covered by asphalt and driveways and buildings, but it's a lot. Uh, monocultures, a lot of it GMO, cover up at least 250 million acres. Lawns are also an exotic habitat, generally ineffective for, for any wildlife, 40 million acres in the, in the lower 48. And then we have cell phone towers, night lights, and invasive plants. We have a lot of strikes against our wildlife. So the, 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 the invasive plants I'll talk about briefly, and I'm not going to cover all of them, are the grasses, uh, Johnson, Japanese, stiltgrass, Bermuda, and fescue. Forbes, uh, Cerisia lespedeza, teasel, knapweed, hedge parsley, perilla, queen anne's lace, thistles. Actually, I'm not going to cover all of those. Vines, Japanese honeysuckle, oriental bittersweet, kudzu, euonymus, English ivy, avincas, uh, shrubs, and trees. So we have invasive plants in all these categories, and um, some are worse than others. Um, getting back to the whole topic of lawns, this is my neighbor's house across the street from me right now. I mean, the picture was taken in 2015, but they're I'm not knocking my neighbors, they're nice people, but their yard is not much of a wildlife uh, refuge or wild plant refuge. And um, this is ours, and a lot of this was, this was from quite a long time ago. A lot of these are not native. We've replaced a lot of them with native, but our yard is messy, but it's a haven for hummingbirds, pollinators, bees, and butterflies, right in Wilson Park. So the difference between a lot of lawns and yards and trying to make your, your, your place friendly for uh, wildlife is, is striking and can be done. The first grass I'm gonna talk about briefly is Bermuda grass. Uh, this is one I basically have given up against, um, but it's a, it's a non-native from Africa and Asia. Uh, anybody that's dealt with Bermuda knows it's a plant. Uh, it, it's very aggressive, crowds out other grasses even, invades, and um, I've dug it up, I've pulled it up, and um, you know, it's just a problem grass of not much utility. Um, but here's one of the thing, impacts of an invasive plant like Bermuda uh, on wildlife. Uh, most people are aware that bobwhite quail are in great decline. I never hear them. I used to hear them in Fayetteville at the research farm where I work. There used to be a covey there, but I never hear of them anymore. Um, they go to a true prairie. And one of the reasons for the decline of bobwhite quail is Bermuda grass and other non-native grasses that have come in and been put into or replaced old clump grasses, native clump, clump grasses in our pastures. So the quail have no place to live because the grass is too dense and they can't hide and they can't find seeds. So here's an invasive non-native grass, which is affecting our bobwhite quail uh, survival. Another grass, which I deal with all the time, I, I assume most of you are dealing with this one, is Johnson grass. Uh, this is one of my worst enemies. Uh, it's native to the Mediterranean and Africa. Uh, it can be poisonous to, to cattle, but it's considered one of the top 10 worst weeds in the world. It was deliberately planted by a plantation owner named Colonel William Johnson in 1840. And here's my wife holding up and she pulled up and you can see these rhizomes. These rhizomes really give this plant a fantastic edge over many other plants. If you cut it down, I go out with my scythe and I cut down Johnson grass in a week or two, it's just like it was because it comes back up from this rhizome. It can survive really hot, dry weather 
and it's all over Fayetteville now. And, um, you know, not a desirable plant at all, really. I mean, farmers will turn it into hay, but it's a serious problem. I heard my wife trying to cut and pull up Johnson grass on our West Fork property. Um, it, has, it has actually taken a lot of native plants out of our property, and, and I'm not sure how to deal with that. If any of you have a great idea on how to get rid of Johnson grass ecologically, tell me. Okay, uh, now here's another quote I like. Um, most of these invasive plants were brought in deliberately by botanists and agriculturalists. Multiflora rose was brought in deliberately, Johnson grass, Japanese stilt grass, Ailanthus. And this illustrates one of my quotes I really like by Goethe. Nothing is so terrible as activity without insight. The reason I like that is because people deliberately brought these plants in and now we're burdened with these, these exotic plants and will be for the foreseeable for future. Uh, you, know, you have to be very careful what you bring in um, to have an ecosystem. And Goethe wasn't talking about plants, but he's talking about doing stuff without insight is not so great. Okay, so now here's one of the new ones I'm dealing with, this is Japanese stilt grass. Uh, Microstegium venemium. I, I first saw this on our property about three or four years ago and didn't realize what it was. Just some grass I didn't recognize. Uh, it came in on packing material from China around 1919. It's an annual, extremely aggressive and invades the forests, which is unlike a lot of our grasses. Uh, I'll show you some pictures. Uh, it, it's considered one of the most damaging invasive plant species in North America, spreads extremely rapidly, can grow in low light. Uh, it's easy to pull up, and I pulled up lots of it, but it invades so quickly, it, pretty soon you can't pull it all up. Um, so I'll show you some pictures of this one. Now, this is not my picture. Most of the pictures here are mine, but this is picked of stilt grass in New York State. So it's been there longer than it's been here. This is in woods. But I'm now seeing it in Lost Valley, Buffalo River National Park, uh, West Fork on our farm, Queen Wilhelmina State Park, Costa River, Lake Fayetteville. I'm starting to see it everywhere. And I don't think almost anybody's dealing with it. And this is what it's gonna do. It's gonna cover the forest floors and it's gonna smother our native wildflowers. Um, it's already doing this. Uh, I, I, it's it's a common problem. So if you see this plant, pull it up before it seeds and try to keep on top of it on your property because um, I'm seeing it coming up all over our 40 acres. And this is what it looks like. This is on our property. When it has lots of sun, it's very tall, two to three feet tall. It lodges, it smothers everything underneath it. It's seeding right now. Uh, here's my wife trying to pull it up in our forest. The truth is, we could pull up this grass for three or four solid weeks and not get it all. We just don't have the time. So we're not gonna win this battle at the moment. Um, now, I wanted to take a little digression, a trip to Lake Fayetteville. I went there yesterday. Just hang in there for a moment. Cause Lake Fayetteville Trail near the Botanical Gardens has it all. Has Japanese stilt grass coming in, Sericea lespediza, Johnson grass, bush honeysuckle, privet, and mountains of oriental bittersweet, which is another new problem. So here's the trail yesterday, very sweet, but almost everything in here besides some of the trees and some of the shrubs is non-native. And so these are some small pictures. There's Japanese stilt grass infestation right on the trail, bush honeysuckle producing tons of berries, ready for birds to carry them everywhere. Oriental bittersweet producing millions and millions of fruits. And then perilla beefsteak plant. It's all there. I'm not showing you all the pictures of it. Um, and you know the city's not gonna be able to take care of that. Uh, they need to get some teams of volunteers who have the time to go out with chainsaws and saws and loppers and pull and try to cut some of this down. Why? Because the oriental bittersweet is gonna spread everywhere in Washington County. Okay, so my take home message from this jaunt to Lake Fayetteville, our local parks are packed with invasive plants. And I'm not faulting anybody, but this is even near our botanical garden. Um, 
it's going to get much worse unless we do something. Uh, these plants spread by many mechanisms. Birds eat the fruits and spread the seeds widely. People move them when they cut and move hay on their feet and their tires. Wind, rain, streams move the seeds. On our property out in West Fork, we find seedlings of invasives deep in our woods. We pull them up, but if we didn't, our forest would be full of invasive plants. And we can't count on anybody to solve this problem. It's going to have to be volunteers, just not enough people. So we have to educate the public, enlist volunteer cadres to fight this battle. So now look at stilt, stilt grass a little bit more. This is on last year on the goat trail at Buffalo River, stilt grass. Nobody pulling it up. And it, this year it's probably like quadruple or a hundred times more. And it's seeding at this point. You know, somebody has to do this, has to go to these parks and pull these things up and cut them down. I actually girdled an Atlantis tree on the goat trail. I had to sort of surreptitiously do it, but I did it because I don't want Atlantis, but I see them along the Buffalo River. Okay, so that's still grass. That's a new one, it's terribly serious. If you see it, pull it up. Um, Cerisia lespediza is a nightmare. Uh, this one came from Asia, was deliberately brought over here for forage and erosion. Um, I consider this one of my, my most serious problems, but I see it on the Buffalo National River, Mount Magazine, all along Highway 49, Queen Wilhelmina, Lake Fayetteville, Woolsey, Wet Prairie, it's everywhere. Three to five feet tall, produces tons of seeds right now. The seeds can survive 20 years, has tap roots which help it survive cutting. Uh, it crowds out everything. Uh, I can't tell you how bad this one is. Uh, I cut it down, I burn it, and I'm going to probably have to use herbicides. But this shows a picture of what it looks like. A lot of people think it's kind of attractive. Uh, very aggressive plant. Um, crowds out a lot of things. And this is on my property, August, uh, October 2020 along Rock Creek. It's about four feet tall, very dense, uh, putting out thousands of seeds. You might say, well, why didn't you cut that, Donald? Because we have mountains of it. I can cut for weeks. I can't cut it all. And all these seeds are on Rock Creek. They're washing down Rock Creek and they're going everywhere in the water. This is another view of it along Rock Creek. It's a very bad plant. It doesn't produce a lot of caterpillars. I've seen one caterpillar on that plant in my life. And uh, it's not even very good for bees. Uh, and birds don't eat it much. I'll show you a picture of their seeds. Okay, this is along the Buffalo National River in 2019, and uh, there's Lespediza. So Japanese stiltgrass, Atlantis, Lespediza, all coming up in the Buffalo River. If nobody comes down and deals with this, it's going to increase. And eventually, you're going to go to the, the National River, and it's going to be all invasives. Uh, one time, the seed pot of Lespediza, and I took it out, and this is a millimeter ruler. It's a very tiny seed. And I don't think birds are eating it much, just so tiny. But those plants produce millions of seeds. They last 20 years, big problem. And strangely enough, uh, Cerisia lespediza seed is still being sold in the United States. This one even says it's really difficult to control, but they're selling it for $9, $10 a pound. That's a lot of Cerisia lespediza seeds. And um, why, why it's even allowed to be sold is beyond me. Um, now, this is a minor invasive plant. We have this invasive plant on our property. Uh, comes from Asia, uh, Perilla a frutescens beefsteak plant. It's aromatic, used in cooking, but it also crowds out native wildflowers. Um, it's relatively easy to pull up. So I pull it up a lot and I've seen some reduction, but I've never seen caterpillars on it. I have seen bees on it. So it has some value. And there's the leaves of beefsteak plant. And here's a seeding beef take plant. At least it pulls up easily. Um, and it's actually kind of a pretty plant and you'll see butterflies on it and some bees. Uh, so it's not the worst of invasive plants, but it's, it's one I'm trying to discourage because I want native plants, not, not exotics. So that's, that's my take home message here. There's a hierarchy in invasive plants. Some are worse than others. Some serve almost zero ecological services. Some have a role, but not as good as native plants. Um, so dandelion, I actually like, it's exotic. Queen Anne's lace, I don't like too much, but it's, it's not the worst. Hedge parsley, I don't like. 
uh, perilla, but they're not the worst. Johnson grass, oriental bittersweet, sericea, Bradford pears, there's a lot worse ones. Okay, now, so here's another fairly new one in Fayetteville, and this one's a major up and coming problem. Oriental bittersweet, Celastris orbiculatus, native to Asia, brought here deliberately as an ornamental for erosion control. It's a woody vine, can easily climb big trees and strangle them. It spreads by vast numbers of seeds and underground roots. Uh, this is one of the worst ones in Fayetteville, and I don't think anybody's doing that much against it. Uh, here's what I saw yesterday on the Fayetteville Trail. So here's the fruits of uh, Oriental Bittersweet all along the trail. Thousands upon thousands, millions probably of fruits being produced. Um, here's trees along the trail completely covered by Oriental Bittersweet vines. I mean, it grows right up the trees. It weighs them down, it smothers them, it steals the light from them, and it fruits. Uh, it's really bad. Um, here's some more pictures of them covering trees. I mean, this is right at the beginning of the Lake Fayetteville Trail. And, um, you know, if we had a team of 25 people and went in there for an afternoon, we could probably cut most of these and probably would have to herbicide the, the cut places. But uh, it's not being done. Um, so those seeds are all going to be spreading all over northwest Arkansas. Other ones which you're probably familiar with are, are Japanese honeysuckle, a very fragrant, attractive vine, but it really covers things up and smothers them and is very difficult to control. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, I'm just going to go through some of the vines. Um, English ivy is another one which people plant deliberately. Uh, here it is on a tree in Fayetteville. Um, it's, it's bad for the trees. During the big ice storm, a lot of trees fell down because of the weight of the vines covered with ice. Um, birds spread the seeds of this plant widely, and um, it's, it's illegal in Oregon. It should be illegal here. Uh, anybody that has it should cut it off their tree, pull it off, and poison it. Kudzu, I'm sure you've all seen kudzu, um, also brought into the U.S. from Japan, 1876. They say it's spreading at a rate of 150,000 acres a year. Um, I see a lot of it in Arkansas, and it's doing things like this. It's not my picture, but uh, it covers everything up, smothers it, and it's a difficult one to control. So, you know, again, we need people to work against these things. This is a picture of a uh, Euonymus fortuni uh, covering trees in Arkansas. And we see this a lot. If you drive around the countryside, you'll see these uh, vines of various sorts, but, but Euonymus climbing up the trees and causing a lot of trouble for the trees. So uh, that one also came in in 1907 from China and it's still sold in some states. If I see this and I have the right to do it, I cut it off the tree and try to poison the stump. So now I want to talk about some of the shrubs briefly. And I know you all know about bush honeysuckle, but it's um, really impressive how much territory in Northwest Arkansas is covered by this plant. And it's got flowers. Uh, I've never seen a caterpillar eating it. So that means the birds have to search vast amounts of terrain for no caterpillars when they're feeding their young. Uh, I have seen a honeybee on this plant, one. And I watch for honeybees all the time because I teach a course in beekeeping. And so it is not a good pollinator plant. It's not a good caterpillar plant. And it shades out things underneath it. But here's the picture of a honeybee on bush honeysuckle getting some pollen. So in, when they're desperate, the bees will come, but this is not a preferred plant at all for pollinators or insects. And here's one of the reasons why. This is on the Frisco Trail in Fayetteville, the biking hiking trail in December 9, 2013. This is almost all bush honeysuckle uh, along with some privet and euonymus and stuff, all green in December. Everything else has lost its leaves they're still photosynthesizing, you know? That gives them a big edge on, on our native shrubs and then they shade everything out in the summertime. And they produce millions of fruits, which I don't think nutritionally are very good for birds. I've sometimes thought of doing a study of the nutritional value of, of berries, but the fruit birds will eat the berries of a bush honeysuckle. And we find bush honeysuckle all over our property in the woods dropped by birds in their droppings. So if you take a berry of uh, 
of bush honey stuff and you open up and you see five uh, little seeds which get deposited in the soil. So now this is my backyard in Fayetteville. So I have land out in the country, but I have land in Fayetteville, uh, my, my yard. And this is a little bush honeysuckle seedling coming up in our yard uh, one spring. Uh, here's a bunch I pulled up. And then this is, I took 15 minutes to pull up every invasive plant I could find in a small area of my yard uh, last spring, I guess. And in 15 minutes, I pulled up 96 seedling bush honeysuckles 47 privet and 11 red cedars. Now that's a lot of plants. And it means that all over the area, these little plants are coming up. And if nobody's pulling them up in 10 years, it's gonna be wall to wall uh, invasive shrubs. Okay. Privet is another major problem. I mean, some of you probably seen this. I have seen vast areas of privet in natural areas. It produces a vast number of berries, which the, the birds carry around. Again, almost a useless plant for caterpillars. I, I don't see bees on privet. Some beekeepers claim that bees do go to it. I don't believe it at the moment. Um, so that's a plant to cut off, poison, pull up, uh, stop it anytime you see it. Multiflora rose is another shrub, which is a problem. It seems at first, I thought it was one of the worst ones. I don't think it's now as bad as privet and bush honeysuckle, but uh, it was brought in deliberately by the US government as living fences. And it's, it's considered to be a major problem in some states. Fruits are dispersed widely by birds. One plant may produce a million seeds that can stay in the soil for 20 years. So this is one of those plants I say, kill on site if you can. Destroy it whenever possible. Nandina, I'll talk briefly about that. Um, it's not the most invasive of plants, of shrubs, uh, but it's widely planted for some reason. Um, it's evergreen. Uh, it's not good for pollinators. It's not good for uh, uh, butterflies or, or, or caterpillars. It produces a shiny red berry. And I guess that's one reason people like it. But all parts of this plant contain cyanide. And so, the Nandina berries look pretty in the fall, and I see it all over the place. To me, it's a really ugly shrub. There's privet, and this is my neighborhood, uh, and there's Nandina. To me, it's a really ugly shrub compared to a native shrub. But anyway, it's all over the place, and uh, it also spreads by runners, and uh, it can push out native trees and plants. But the number one reason I think it's immoral to even plant this plant or have it on your property is our, our songbirds in the wintertime will eat berries of Nandina because they eat hollies and other berries natively. They don't know this is poisonous. And there's studies showing that Nandina berries kill our cedar waxwings and other birds by the poison in them. So at this point, I consider it to be like an immoral thing to even have a Nandina in your yard. Um, but if you walk around uh, Fayetteville, they're everywhere. People still plant them and they're every place. So the US government now classifies Nandina as noxious invasive weed. It's in our national parks. Uh, so anyway, another one to kill if you can. I won't go through this too much. Uh, it, I've already gone through it. So now I'll talk briefly a couple, couple trees and I'll finish up in a, in a fairly short time. Uh, Alanthus altissima, the, the tree of heaven at one time was called, is now called tree of hell, is widely seen in, um, in Northwest Arkansas. All along Route 49 going north to Bentonville, you'll see lots of it. Uh, I see it out in deep woods. I see it at the Buffalo River. It's native to China. It was brought here deliberately in the 1700s. People thought it was beautiful, but it smells terrible. It kills other plants. Uh, it's got a lot of things wrong with it. And um, now people are, are hip to the fact this is a bad tree. Uh, this is not my picture, but that's a mature tree. Looks sort of like a walnut in a way, has uh, pinnate leaves, has kind of a smooth bark. Uh, the flowers actually smell terrible. They're fly pollinated. And the pollen is highly allergenic. A lot of people have problems with, with allergies. And this is a bad plant for human allergies. Uh, produces hundreds of thousands of winged samaras, which get blown all around in the fall. Um, so it's, it's 
definitely one which everyone in the city should be killed, but uh, it's not happening. Uh, this is in Wilson Park in 2012. They have cut some of them down, but here's an Ailanthus here. And here's another one on the right growing up in Wilson Park. They've cut some, but there's still some there. Um, they have these pinate leaves. Uh, the leaves stink. They smell like uh, popcorn. Um, and uh, they have a very large petiole. There's the petiole scar, which is typical of Ailanthus. So here's some more in, in Fayetteville. There, this was, these are old pictures, 2012 that I took. But all through the historic district, you'll see mature uh, Ailanthus trees all along Mount Sequoia. And you see baby ones coming up. And um, there's along College Avenue, there's the skate place, there's an Ailanthus. Uh, they're along Baba Boudin's. Um, so anyway, it's highly invasive, it suppresses other plants, it re-sprouts from the stumps. Um, it's toxic to humans. I've chainsawed it, and when I chainsaw it, I feel sick afterwards. It's known to be toxic to the heart. The pollen is highly allergenic, and it supports almost no caterpillars. Um, it's, it's just a crappy tree in every way, and there should be a massive effort in Fayetteville and Northwest Arkansas to destroy this plant. Um, I, I won't spend too much of it, but even in Europe, this is a problem. It's, it's known to be all over the United States, it's known to be a problem tree. And I, I just pointed out where I've seen them um, almost everywhere. Uh, big thickets of it here and there. And, and, you know, one day I'd like to get permission from the Buffalo National River to go in with my chainsaw and cut them all down, at least along the river. But I don't know if they would let me do that. Okay, so I won't mince words. Every Ailanthus in Fayetteville should be killed as soon as possible because it's spreading millions more seeds each year. And uh, people should go up along 49 and chainsaw them. And, um, that one we could probably stop if everybody cut them down. I have a couple more trees to go over and then I'll be done. Bradford pears, I know you're all familiar with them. I've cut down many of these plants. Uh, totally worthless plant. And it's still being sold, um, it's still being planted, and uh, it's all over the place. Um, this is in Wilson Park. Uh, people think it's pretty, but the, the, the flowers don't smell good, doesn't produce caterpillars, bees don't really go to it. It's uh, just a dumb plant. And uh, that's, on, that's 2015 on old wire. You know, I could take pictures of that all day. And here's the fruits of calorie pear, a little hard fruit. And, and I think birds do distribute this. Um, though it doesn't seem very uh, edible, but, but it does pop up, and so they must be spreading it. Okay, this is my basically my last slide. Um, this is a quote from Chief Seattle, which I like, uh, is, humankind has not woven the web of life, we're but one strand within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together, all things connect. Um, Humans brought almost all these invasive plants and creatures over to North America, and it's impacting all the wildlife and wildflowers of North America. And uh, we're the only ones that are going to solve this problem. Um, and so uh, my summary is, this is a war. And there's battles in my yard, there's battles in Wilson Park, there's battles in Woolsey Prairie, Lake Fayetteville. And no place is safe, not even the Buffalo National River. And there's very few workers or warriors. Uh, most people in North America probably aren't even aware of invasive plants. And um, so our birds and butterflies and bees are depending on us. The tools we have are our labor, our chainsaws, our thighs, getting down on our hands and knees, doing controlled burns, educating, and using herbicides. There might be more, but uh, I've worked in the area of biological control of insects for 40 years, but I don't think there's a lot of biological control that's gonna take place with these invasive weeds for various reasons, which be a, a different topic. Um, I, I think they're here and we're gonna have to deal with them as best we can. And um, I think if we could get the city and the state and the county to somehow give us their blessing that we could go out and cut Atlantis, uh, we could have an impact. Uh, and, and the very most important thing is recognizing new infestations of plants like autumn olive or Japanese stilt grass and eradicating them before they get a toehold 
in our area. So that's all I have. Um, you know, I'd be interested in answering some comments if, or if you have any magic bullets and you want to share them with us, I would really appreciate that because I have worked hard and um, I'm not winning the battle. Right? So I would be interested in any comments about how we can do this. Should I look at, uh, Eric, should I go up and look at um, previous comments or? I've been monitoring the chat log. I haven't seen any questions. I mean, there's been several comments here, just uh, people chiming in with some uh, various uh, tidbits of information. I wonder what Vicki Hall means there. Not messy, it is a habitat. I'm not sure what that was. I think um, she may have been referring to one of the slides when you were talking about uh, your own yard, maybe. It seemed like it was from earlier on in your presentation. Yeah, maybe the fescue, and the fescue was crowding on little bilia. Yeah. Uh, looks like she confirmed it was, yeah, when reference to your yard. Yeah. Um, oh, the, yeah, the front yard, yeah. Well, you see it now, it looks pretty bad right now. Um, but, uh, but I don't care. Um, I'm glad people are pulling up stilt grass in, in Crystal Bridges, good for you. Actually, Cody George, I wanna call him out. Man, that guy, smart guy about plants and um, does amazing work. And, uh, uh, but I think he would confirm it's not easy. And there's just so much work to do. You need a lot of people that are trained. Um, Right, Lespedeza, I see Japanese beetle feeding on Lespedeza, but not as much as I do on fruit trees and roses. Um, let's see here. Yeah, I would agree that just looking at uh, bush honeysuckle berries, I think they're nutritional content. They're very watery and compared to things like dogwood berries and holly berries. Right, Sue so Raymond's right that mandina gets planted because deer don't eat it. Yeah, well, Tree of Heaven uh, from Nate Weston, yeah, it grows everywhere. I mean, you'll see it, like I say, uh, there's big groves of it in the deep woods that you'll sometimes come upon and um, uh, it's killing everything underneath it. Uh, yeah, I, 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 Sue Raymond says, uh, I wonder why we can't make sure people don't plant Nandina. I, I agree completely. I think that a whole bunch of plants should be considered crimes to, to sell or grow. But I, when I was on the forestry board, uh, some of the alder people really criticized me for that. They said, I should be able to plant anything I want in my yard, you know, and, and that's one of the attitudes. Um, right, I, well, you know, one thing for all of us to work on would be to get the city and county and state to make certain plants illegal. Um, yeah. Well, there's a lot of good stuff going on. I don't, I think that is true. Uh, a lot of people are working on it, but, but my point is we don't need a I mean, hundred people working on it. It's great. We need 10,000 people. We need a hundred thousand people doing it. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I, I didn't want to talk about, I could have talked about all the beautiful native plants you could use to replace these, but then I wouldn't have covered these invasive. So that's all I, I was trying to do. Sounds like um, a follow-up presentation, maybe. Yeah, I, I've been planting a lot of native plants and um, what works really well, of course, are shrubs, native shrubs and trees because they can deal with the smaller stuff. Uh, um, yes, that'd be possible. Is our time out, Eric? Um, I have 2.51. Um, I mean, oh, it looks like... Yeah, I have not seen very many questions yet. I'm well, that's really long, isn't it? I think we're um, done. Okay, um, well, let me go ahead and do the outro here. Uh, thank you, Don. Really appreciate you sharing your time and your expertise with us. Uh, I definitely learned a lot, and uh, judging from the comments, it looks like a lot of people uh, feel the same way. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here today. Uh, again, this a recording of this webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, so check that out, Wild Ones Ozark Chapter. Uh, on YouTube. Uh, our next webinar will be at 11 a.m. Thursday, November 5th. Uh, that will be Cody George speaking about ecological land care, integrating horticulture with ecology. 
uh, Don brought up Cody's expertise earlier, so you, uh, you really don't want to miss that one. If you want to join, join our chapter, you can go to wildones.org slash membership. Uh, check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash Ozark Wildones, or contact us at wildonesozarkchapter at gmail.com. Uh, thank you, everyone, again, for being here. Thank you, Don, and look forward to seeing all of you on November 5th. Thank you.